thank you so much for having me, first of all. And um, I, I apologize for not being able to be with you in person today. I, I was I was looking forward to coming up, but uh, as of next Thursday, I'm going to be in Glasgow for about two and a half weeks. So um, actually having this weekend back at home, um, all of a sudden became a bit more important to try and try and recover as much as possible before the madness begins at COP26. Um, but no, really pleased to, to be with you and just shout if you can't hear me for any reason. Um, I think I'm on the point of the fan with the best signal, but we never can be quite sure. So just shout if it goes a bit wobbly um, and I can stop and start start again. Um, but my, my name is Adele Jones. I'm Deputy Chief Executive of the Sustainable Food Trust. And for those who um, don't know the Sustainable Food Trust, we are, we are a UK-based charity, a small UK-based charity, um, but we also have an international focus. And our mission is to accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food and farming systems. We were set up, we were set up by um, our director, Patrick Holden, who um, was previously the chief executive of the Sustainable, uh, sorry, the Soil Association for 15 years running the organic certification um, and so we were we were set up about 11 years ago and since then we've been trying to do as much as we can to help farmers but also government and businesses make the transition to more sustainable food and farming so I think um, what I was hoping to talk to you all a little more about today was one of our areas of work called the global farm metric. But just before I get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about barriers to change, I think which are currently preventing a more mainstream transition to, to, to farming in a way which is you know, very much part of the climate change solution, nature solution, public health solution. And I think the most obvious of those is, is the financial barriers in place for farming. And, you know, we can't, we can't blame anyone for not following the money. And, you know, the money over the last sort of 40 or so years has, has led us to, to try and uh, produce food in a fairly intensive way, uh, as low as possible cost, because that's what people have demanded. The, the demand for cheap food is still, is still really high, but that has created a really difficult economic environment for farmers, which has led us, you know, led us all down this road of a race to the bottom effectively in terms of prices. And so we've been thinking for a while about how we correct these distortions, because actually, I'm sure as many of you know, um, producing food in a, in a very intensive way is, but that's only because the value of the kind of negative damage on, let's say, the environment or, or human health. And actually, if you factored those costs in to the kind of cost of production, it, it you know, the business case for producing food in that, you know, more intensive way wouldn't be so sound. And so we're, we've been thinking for a while as an organization about how we how we correct those distortions and how we value things that we previously haven't valued in monetary terms, for example, nature or water quality or air quality or biodiversity or you know, even animal welfare and, and community, community health and well-being. And I think if we, can, if we can start to place a value on those things and convince you know, the treasury business leaders that they are actually an incredibly important part, part of our economy, it will shift the, the business model to you know, farming in a way which protects those things rather than degrades those things. But, um, and it's you know, a big but, uh, we have been working on this, on this discipline of what we call true cost accounting for a number of years, trying to place the true value uh, on food by thinking about these externalities as, e uh, as economists call them, the external costs of agriculture that we don't quite realize we're paying for at the moment in hidden ways. So we've been working on true cost accounting for a number of years, but we realized that actually it's very difficult to place a value on things like nature, um, less pollution, reduced soil erosion, um, unless you have a common way of measuring those things in the first place. And so about six years ago, we were pondering on this, this question of, okay, 
you know, much like the financial accounting standards where everyone has to submit their tax return or their annual accounts in the same way. It doesn't matter if you're a one man band business or a you know, multinational company, you all have to submit your accounts in the same way. And it uses a common framework and a common language for so doing kind of no matter where you are in the world. We, we started thinking, well, surely the same is now needed for sustainability and in our case, you know, farm and food sustainability. And, you know, if we were to create that framework, it has to start at the farm. It has to, it has to be something which is meaningful and useful to farmers rather than something which is imposed by government or even academics on farming. It has to be something which genuinely empowers every farmer around the world to start measuring their impact and from that be able to derive an idea about you know the direction they, they might need to go in and perhaps some you know some of these new business model that models that they could start following so we we put this challenge back to a group of farmers back in 2016 and said look you, you know you all measure a whole lot of stuff on your farms at the moment you have to do your certification audits you have to do a compliance check you have to apply for your basic payment and your do your stewardship options you quite quite a lot of them who we were working with had to do a carbon footprint for their retail contracts for example so farmers are already measuring or at least supplying data to all sorts of different places and so we said to this group of farmers who represented a whole different spectrum of sizes and enterprises um, we said to them well what do you what do you think you should be measuring what do you think the best bits of things that you are already doing are and from that they pulled together um, this harmonized framework for measuring on farm sustainability and that has 11 categories of assessment and three key indicators under those 11 categories and it really covers you know it takes a very whole farm approach so it covers the economic the environmental and the social elements of farming and so the 11 categories if I can remember them are um, soil water air and climate biodiversity plant and crop health animal health and welfare nutrient management um, energy and resource use, productivity, social capital, human capital. I think I said one of those twice because I've got to 12. Um, but uh, there's, there are 11 categories of assessment. And, and we're now calling that the global farm metric because we believe this common framework for measuring on farm sustainability should genuinely be common for every farmer across the world. And of course, what good looks like in different parts of the world will, will vary. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at soil health indicators, for example, in, in the UK, and then comparing that with soil health indicators for farms in sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, it's it's different, and, and what, what they're aiming for is slightly different, but the principles are the same. We all need to be moving towards better soil health, uh, improved water quality, air quality, biodiversity, animal welfare, nutrient recycling, etc. And so we, what we're trying to work out is how common can these metrics and indicators be for farmers across the world and that can we therefore create this common framework and common language which will allow all farmers to start making incremental improvements in that direction of greater sustainability and with this framework because we're focusing on outcome indicators so um, kind of quantitative impacts where possible it means we can kind of rise above this terminology turf war as I like to call it um, for things like, you know, should we be moving towards regenerative farming or agroecological farming or nature friendly farm farming or climate smart agriculture or, or in sustainable intensification or, you know, any, whatever word you want to use, whichever the word of the day is. Um, they're all, you know, trendy words at the moment. And what we're saying was, yeah, of course, you know, there can be different schools of thought about which farming systems we need to you know, be encouraging farmers to, to move towards if they aren't already doing some of these things, which is obviously the case with a, with a lot of farms. Um, but what we're, what we're focusing on is the principles surrounding those things. So as I said, soil health, air quality, water quality, biodiversity. And it kind of means you can rise above those, those, those sort of questions about which, which school of thought we should all be following. Because actually there's no one that disagrees we shouldn't be trying to improve each of those areas of farm sustainability. And so that's what we're trying to achieve with the global farm metric. And um, I mean, this, this idea really started as a project being discussed by a group of farmers, as I mentioned, and it's now being taken forward by a, a coalition, the, the global farm metric coalition, which includes almost 60 
organizational partners, and that includes the, the major retailers, so Tesco, Morrison, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, um, the National Farmers Union, the CLA, um, uh, banks and investors. We're working really closely with NatWest Bank, um, NGOs, the likes of WWF and uh, Food and Farm and Countryside Commission and others, um, DEFRA, Welsh Government, Scottish Government, um, we're all we're in discussion with all those partners and they're, and they're basically helping us alongside farmers, of course, because we still believe they're the most important stakeholders in this process um, to develop this framework, refine the framework and then understand how it can be adopted so that farmers can measure sustainability in the same way. But then government can measure sustainability on farms in the same way, the same for bank lenders uh, and investors, the same for uh, food companies and retailers who are looking at transparency of their supply chains and sourcing policies. If we can get all these different stakeholders to start measuring on farm sustainability and reporting on on farm sustainability in the same way, it's going to, you know, it's going to mean that we can all we can all start moving in that same direction rather than farmers having to complete multiple different audits, which is obviously time consuming, costly, bureaucratic. Uh, consumers not understanding what all the different labels mean and the risk of having things like carbon labeling, for example, which as I'm sure you you all know, only tells one part of the story of agriculture. We're really focusing on this holistic view of what's happening on a farm so that we can communicate that in, in the round to consumers rather than focusing on single issues. So if we can encourage you know, governments, food companies, retailers, banks, investors, um, and of course farmers to start measuring and reporting on sustainability in the same way we can use this as a toolkit to drive change and help farming become you know the number one climate change solution which is certainly where we feel it should be and feel it's a really exciting time for agriculture because we have the opportunity to do that um so in the i mean in the interest of time i won't i won't say too much more than that because i you know if there's any questions i'd love to try and answer them if that's possible um and i know we've run over a little bit so so, um, so I, I won't uh, keep your your program going over for too long. Um, but I, if anyone has any questions or thoughts, then I'd be I'd be really happy to answer those. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for having me. Mm. I'll throw the questions open to the floor then, Adele. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Did you hear that, Adele? I got, no, can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't quite are, catch it. Are there any, is there any thinking about farmers moving their land over to producing biofuels rather than necessarily food production? Yeah, well, obviously, this is quite a hot topic at the moment. And um, to a degree, the global farm metric is neutral in that in that stance, in that we're just trying to measure the impact of a farming system or even a land use, to be honest. Um, of course, there's a productivity category, but it could be used for a national park, let's say, um, if you wanted it to. So the global farm metric is just trying to measure the, the impact of that system. And from that, we hope we will be able to get a much clearer sense of which systems are part of the solution and which ones perhaps aren't but I'm putting my sustainable food trust hat back on now um, and uh, we at the sustainable food trust feel fairly strongly that food uh, that you know our, our farmland should be used to produce food for ideally human beings um, and of course there's some areas of land where that might not be so possible so perhaps some so some sort of isolated sort of biofuel areas is, is okay but we we're really worried about the kind of monoculture maize production that's going on in lots of parts of the country um to as a kind of fodder for the for the um di anaerobic digesters um i don't think that's part of the solution i think we should as much as possible be trying to um grow um food nutritious food for for human beings in harmony with nature but of course you know it's it's the balance of everything ultimately we that we need at the end of the day um but i think it, you know if it's part of a rotation perhaps that's okay but we definitely don't want to see monocultures of bio biofuel crops thank you any other questions because if not i've got one <laughs> um 
the previous conversation, which overran horribly and, and delayed you, I'm terribly sorry. Um, That's all right. We were talking about the availability of abattoir facilities for that are accessible for smallholders. Um, and it's very clear that particularly in Scotland, we do have to travel quite a long way to um, take our animals to slaughter. Um, and with smallholders in particular, um, there's, there's a local um, abattoir close to, to us, that, um, well, relatively close, that is very highly utilised, even though their capacity is small, because of the way they treat our animals. And that matters a lot to smallholders. Um, the travel distances for animals going to slaughter and how they're treated. Is that something that you would consider as part of the sustainability measure, or are you focusing purely on what's happening on the farm? So we're starting with what's happening on the farm, but um, uh, we at the Sustainable Food Trust are really involved in this support for small abattoirs, small local abattoirs. So we um, are, well, we have set up um, the um, sector sector group for local abattoirs, um, which is being run by DEFRA now, um, which is fantastic, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I mean, I think the, the, the degree of regulation that applies to small abattoirs compared to the enormous ones is highly disproportionate and obviously yeah, yeah, don't need to talk about it because you guys have been talking about it by the sounds of it but um, we're really really supportive of um, trying to save small abattoirs and so what what we're hoping is that um, we can have a, 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 me a measure um, linked into the global farm metric which measures distance to slaughter first of all um, we think that's an important element of sustainability but of course within the animal welfare category as well I think we shouldn't you know we shouldn't forget that an animal's life doesn't necessarily end before the farm gate you know it's 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 we've got to take into account what happens once it leaves the farm gate and therefore um we again feel strong strongly that where possible if, if animals can go through a small local abattoir rather than uh you know a giant one um that's that's much better and of course traveling fewer distances as well so we definitely see that as something we'd like to communicate to um citizens because i think the reason why there's a swathe of people going vegan and vegetarian now is because it's it's effectively a protest vote against industrial agriculture and these you know these horrible pictures of huge abattoirs and the long distances that animals have to travel so you can understand why it's it's happening but it, it makes it even more important that we tell this different story and make it possible to tell a different story by ensuring that infrastructure is in place so yeah the short answer is not yet but we're getting there and it's something with really passionate about thank you any more questions yes. how do you mean value for farmers Adele, how would you say that the um, global farm metrics would fit into uh, the value proposition for a farm or a smallholder and, and how we could um, make that something that the consumer understands? I think it's, I think it's hugely valuable for, for smallholder farmers because, I mean, I'm generalising slightly, but I'd say in you know in general smallholder farmers are, are bringing a lot of sustainability benefits in a very holistic way and so i think i think the difficulty is at the moment that that consumers even label such as organic you know biodynamic uh, perhaps leaf mark i don't i don't think consumers really know what they mean and to be honest i spend my whole life thinking about these things and often i go into the supermarket and think i don't know what the, half that stuff means um and so i think much like the sort of nutrition labeling 
with the fat sugar salt traffic light that's you know it doesn't matter whether you're in tesco waitrose whatever it's it's the same system i think we need the same for sustainability now and, it, and my view is that our 11 categories in the global farm metric distill quite nicely into three which is nature climate and health and well-being and i think whether it's a score or a traffic light system that we can have on every single product in the in in in, in you know shop supermarket box schemes wherever you buy your food i think it, it gives consumers that much more full picture of the sustainability of that farm and therefore hopefully you know obviously of course there's there's all sorts of um conversations we can have about price and making sure everyone has access to healthy and sustainable food but i think if you can if you can see that you know this this pack of carrots let's say on a traffic light system is all green and it's come from a small farm and then this pack of carrots is perhaps red and orange and it's come from a very large farm the small farm one might be you know 40p more or something but if you could if you can have you know more information upon which to make that decision i think more i think more people might might make that decision to support small sustainable ideally local farmers so i think it's huge value add i think transparency of supply chains is really going to change the way people buy food um so it's really important and obviously you know for smallholders if anything it's more important that government uh, food companies um etc are all measuring things in the same way so that it's less you know it's less of a hassle for you all um having to having to do those audits because really that's not really what farmers you know want to be doing they want to be farming not having to do paperwork the whole time so if we can make it as easy as possible i think that's that's a big win i think the thing for smallholders is obviously our produce is not competitively priced at the supermarket or the mm. mass producers and i think I think what we're looking for is a way to be able to explain in a simple way to the consumer what's better about it. And that exactly. small and local is actually really important. And it, it's, it's much more than just the animal itself. It's what it means for the community and for the environment as a whole. And we struggle because it's expensive to try and do that marketing. We don't have the time. Mm. Most of us actually have full-time jobs elsewhere as well as doing our yeah, small absolutely. Um, and obviously major suppliers, major farming families have got a lot more money and time to invest in that. Yeah, so, absolutely. And if like, if let's say, because hopefully DEFRA, you know, with the, with the new ELM scheme is, um, is is lowering the um area you know threshold for entering into that new scheme um so hopefully there'll be opportunities for you to you know uh, oh, sorry i'm talking defra england scottish government um also i'm working with um the scottish ag minister at the moment on these proposals um but the the idea is hopefully that you'll be able to access those new those new schemes and if they can uh, as part of that um, entry into the new schemes there can be a sustainability assessment which is then hopefully the same as you know the sustainability assessment that we then communicate to consumers and it's uh, yeah it's 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 hopefully going to drive change by enabling that story to be told hopefully in a quite a simple way for people mm. i think that would be really helpful I, I can only speak for ourselves but what we've found is that all the schemes that are available in scotland are closed to us either we're too old or we earn too much because we have to work full time to do something well. else or, or we've got too much land or we don't have enough land or everything that's open to the members of the nfu are largely not accessible to small small producers in scotland um, and that Absolutely. is a problem it's a massive problem and i'm i'm lucky i'm i'm, so I'm on the board of the the this um the advisory board for this um for mari um at the moment and and her team and luckily there's there's a, there's actually a quite a number of smallholder or at least small very small farmers um on that board represented as well as organizations like nourish scotland so i think i really think that voice is now being heard which is fantastic and um, so hopefully hopefully we can get that through it's really good news any more questions from anybody Thanks very much for your time, Adele. We really appreciate it. And I apologize no, no again for the technical pro problems we've had this afternoon. Oh, don't worry. I, I sympathize entirely with IT systems. But no, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your questions. And um, you never know, maybe next year we can make it happen in person.
That would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Have a good bye. day. Thanks. Bye. bye.